Hello, my name is Lewis, and I'm coming to you with the Sunday School lesson for August 13th. And this lesson is entitled, Call to Break Down Barriers. And we'll be taking our text from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Esaias the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understand is thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And the key verse again is read in Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this lesson, a call to break down barriers. We thank you, Lord God, for what you have taught us thus far. We thank you, Lord, for the things that you have given us. Lord God, we ask, Lord God, that you open up our, our mind and our heart's understanding to your word. Help us to get it. Help us to be fruitful in what we've come to know, Lord, in Jesus, and use it in Jesus' name. And so let's start off once again recapping from last week. Last week was the title called To Witness. And we saw that last week the correlation of what is, or what is termed the witness was correlated to the ministry of the word. And we saw that in last week's lesson in three different places on the, in the scripture of the, con, of the text. In verse 2, it talks about, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, they, were, they didn't want to lose their motivation, their drive to witness. And it was that was equaling to them you know, preaching the word or teaching the word. And so we see the correlation between witnessing and the word of God. Then in verse four, it says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word because they came up with a solution to the problem of what was taking them away from preaching the word and giving their witness. And so they they found seven men and gave them those responsibilities so they can do those things while they gave themselves to prayer and ministry in the word. Then the third part we see in verse seven and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And so not only were they effective witnesses in Jerusalem, according to the Great Commission, which we have already established that Jesus uh, departed them, giving them commandment to, you know, go and preach and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, 
which we come to realize in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that Peter was talking about Jesus. And so the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Ghost is that name, that proper name, Jesus. And so everything that they were, were teaching was directly correlated to Jesus. And we're going to see that in today's lesson as well, uh, especially with our key verse in verse 35, how Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture the eunuch was, was uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading from in Isaiah's. And he said, he started to preach unto him, Jesus. And so, again, those things are all attributed. Uh, all these three verses where, where they left the word, uh, where they were concerned about leaving the word, which was their witness. And they had a solution, you know, so that they can be a better witness. And then in verse 7, as a, a result of that better witness and better, that solution, they were an increase in the word of God. They were able to do their jobs and effectively preach to Jerusalem. And not only did they preach to Jerusalem, but they added to themselves priests. It says in that, in that verse, verse 7, it says, And great company of priests were obedient to the faith. That's going to be another thing that is going to come up in today's lesson, being obedient to the faith. We simply, uh, there are some uh, divisions of Christianity that may believe that there is nothing that they can do to be saved. But when you, when you read carefully Acts chapter 2, again, we're going to go right to that again, where Peter is finished preaching his first sermon, and they were cut to the heart. Verse 2, verse 38 it says, now when they heard this, this is verse 37, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the, uh, to the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so they're asking as a result of hearing that preached word and being pricked in their heart, believing what they heard and feeling the guilt and the animosity, the animosity and the uh, remorse that they had in their heart for what had happened to Jesus. And all the things that, that Peter was preaching, that they were pricked in their heart and asked them, what, well, well, what, what do you want us to do? We believe in you. We believe what you're saying. What can we do? And verse 38 says exactly what Peter said. Uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then he goes further and talks about it as promised. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so we see Peter, which was one of those apostles that saw Jesus taken away from them, who heard the commission, who heard Jesus say, go and teach and preach every man and, and all and, uh, and preach them in the name of Christ. And this is in Luke chapter 24 now, in the name of Christ. And then Matthew 28, 18 talks about in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But when we finally get down to the book of Acts, written by Luke himself, you know, the second edition, the second um, part of the story of the church, we see that Luke is now is showing us um, the, the obedience of the apostles to the Great Commission. And they're so concerned with this commission that they, they have to find out solutions to get around, you know, the, the, the obstacles that they're going to come forth. And so last week we mentioned also, and I know I might be jumping the gun. Last week we men mentioned um, problems that were going to affect the church inwardly and outwardly. Inwardly because there was going to be schisms. There's going to be problems that will arise from the inside and cause some kind of division. And so we saw that even um, that when, when, the, when they were all unified, that some of them were not unified with the rest and lied to the Holy Ghost and said that they, paid, they, they sold their houses and put all the money in the pot when in actuality they didn't. And so they lied to the Holy Ghost. They were not in one accord. So we also had things that were coming from the outside of the church, and that was called persecution. And we're going we're gonna to see that as well. And basically, the history of the church, it teeters on those two problems within the early church. Problems within and problems without. 
but the main the the common denominator between the problems within and the problems without stems from even last week's lesson because the church was being uh, called to witness being called not just a witness but like I said before it's correlated with the word of God being spread out and so it, it was called to preach the word and to teach the word according to what Jesus had told them already and so we see that in both instances whether it's problems within the church or problems outside of the church the hindrance to the word of God being preached is the most important thing is the pivotal thing in, in the early church and in today's church, when we have problems on the inside of the church, the witness is, is, is pretty much destroyed. And when we have problems come from outside of the church and we allow those outside forces to actually affect us, the, the witness of the church is destroyed. And that is, the, that, is a, um, that is a fact of life with the church. That is a, a spiritual battle that we fight on the inside and on the outside. And it also speaks to us as individuals. We, we also are fighting, you know, problems within and problems without as, a, as an individual, but more so as a church, because the church carries the word of God. And so while we can definitely relate to the church as a whole, being one single person, each one of us have problems within and problems without. And so is the church. The church is the body of Christ. And the body itself is going to have problems within and problems without. And so if you look at it that way, you, you might be able to get it better. And so last week when they came up with the solution, they chose seven men. In today's lesson, we're talking about one of those men. But we also skip one of these men. And I, I wish we could have had a, a lesson about one of my favorite my favorite uh, favorite uh, characters in the Bible, which was Stephen. Stephen is one of my favorite characters, and I just got finished reading again after like the umpteenth time, chapter seven, his sermon, which when I read it and I know what's about to happen to him, and 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 I, I read it with with such emotion, it gets me to oh, it gets me to tear uh, at times, and so the two men that were of the seven is not only Stephen, but Philip. In today's lesson, we're talking about Philip. And so we see that Stephen was uh, spotlighted by Luke from chapter 6, verse 8, up until chapter 7, verse 60. And then Philip, he was then uh, introduced into the, into the book of Acts in chapter 8, verses 5 through 40. One more thing I wanted to, you know, before we go on into the scripture, Last week, I said something concerning last week's um, about the murmurings of the Grecians against the Hebrews. And I want to give a shout out to one of my subscribers, Turn Up For Christ. He or I'm not sure if this is he or she because Turn Up For Christ is not a male or female name. But Turn Up For Christ actually corrected me on an issue that last week's lesson was not Grecians were not Gentiles. They were Hellenized Jews which I should have known that, and I do know that, but I, I kind of overlooked it last week. And I, I, think, I thank you for correcting me on that, because that is an important thing, because at this point, the gospel was not uh, spread out to the Gentiles yet. And so this is what's important about this week's lesson, because now we have Philip, as a result of certain things happening, some key things happening, some key things being removed, some things being put in place. These things happen as a res and then as a result of these things, Philip was moved and, and, and to do what he did. But I don't want to step on my own toes going in, into it. And so I thank you. Turn up for Christ, one of my subscribers. I, I hope that you all I hope that you have a blessed uh, last Sunday. And blessed Sunday school. This was it wasn't indeed a great Sunday school lesson, and I, I shared it with my Sunday school class as well that I was corrected in this. And, I, and it, 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 when I when I when I'm wrong, I like to right away you know say, look, I'm wrong, and go right to it, and then explain why I'm wrong. And so it doesn't take anything away from me. If, if anything, I, I feel added to. I thank God for you. Turn up for Christ. 
keep doing what you do. Listen, listen, uh, because, you know, iron sharpens iron. I, I need you guys to give me feedback. If I come short, please, by all means, comment on the comment section and tell me, look, I don't know about that. You, you said something that didn't sound right. You, would you mind explaining that? You know, I don't mind doing that. And so I thank you for, for doing that. So Grecians were not Gentiles. They were not, and they were actually Hellenized Jews. And also the fact remains, since last week, there was a bad feeling among the church that caused a rift between the Jews and the Hellenized Jews. And so what, what is the Hellenized Jews? Let, let us remember that they were Hellenized Jews because before Rome became the world leaders of that region, the Greeks were, and they sought to unify their territories by, um, by you know, exposing them to their culture. And so in exposing them to their culture and their language, they took all kinds of people. It wasn't just Jews. It was anybody who were under the, all, under the umbrella of the Greeks, of the Greek empire and the Greek empire sought to, you know, influence their way of thinking, their way of doing things. And so when we think about that, the Hellenized Jews believed in Jesus and the Jews, the Jews, Jews believed in Jesus. And these were part of the first, the early church, the early um, church believing believers. <laughs> and so now these two are together and they remember in this just to be um accurate. Remember in Acts chapter four, it says that they they neither lacked neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or households sold them, and brought prices the prices of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And so it stands the reason that when they had that distribution, that was the ministration that they were taking the pot from in order to take care of their widows, whether they were Hellenized Jews or regular Jews. Their whole purpose was to take care of all believers within the, the umbrella of church. And so... The Hellenized Jews saw that the, the, the Jewish widows, the Hebrew widows, were being taken care of more than the Hellenized Jews, more than the Grecians. And so they felt a certain kind of way and they felt like, oh, that's not right. And, you know, I can understand that, too. Look, you forgot my mother. You forgot you forgot my people. But at this point, they were trying to be unified and trying to strengthen this unity within a church and for them to have that that idea in their hearts in their minds that was very contrary to the spirit of God moving in the church and so they had to fix that before it became something and this is why uh, this is why the apostles couldn't just remove themselves from preaching the word to serve tables as as it were and so they they chose these seven people to actually do that work so that they can commit themselves to prayer and reading the word and preaching the word. And so in the last week's lesson, the Grecian believers, Jesus believed, uh, the, the Grecian believers of Jesus believed that their widows were being neglected in comparison to the Hebrews. I'm reading my notes, y'all. Although this could be attributed to customs, learned or unlearned, it was potentially fatal to the unity of the early church. As we saw last week, the apostles gave a solution and thwarted such a hit to the most important thing that was the word of God being spread. So between Stephen and Philip was, san was sandwiched an outside problem. So now we have dealt with the inside problem. Now there's going to be another problem. Again, it's going to come from the outside. And so remember uh, last week I mentioned the war, which is a spiritual war against the church being waged inwardly and outwardly. Inwardly through schisms and outwardly through persecutions. In chapter 7 leading to chapter 8 verses 1 through 3, the outward attack was on. And so we see the introduction of a man called Saul after Stephen was stoned to death, you know, at the feet of Saul. And we can actually read that. Uh, let's look at um, chapter 8.
we can actually see chapter 7, verse 58. And what they did to Stephen was they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their, their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And so any Bible scholar who knows anything about Bi the Bible and, and Acts and who this man was, we come to know Saul as our brother, our beloved brother, Paul. And this is before he made the conversion into Christianity, who, who believed in Jesus on his way to Damascus, you know, breathing threatenings and, and about to kill folk. And so verse chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. And so verse 4 is is a moment in, in this particular part of the history of the church that kind of changes things and kind of ramps it up for the spread of the gospel. And so I wanted to put a note in here, uh, and, and I'm, I'm trying to carefully construct this idea. Whether you're with Christ or against Christ, what you do is going to help Christ. Now, I hope I didn't uh, hurt nobody's brain by saying that. Remembering who Saul was, whether he stayed on that side of the fence, threatening and persecuting and killing and committing people to prison and doing all. If Saul stayed on that side of the fence, he was still doing the exact same thing that he would have eventually done anyway, being converted. I hope I didn't lose anybody. I hope you understand. And I don't want nobody you know, telling me, you know, oh, that is heresy or whatever. No, it, it, it's really simple. We know the story because hindsight is twenty twenty. We know that eventually in chapter nine, Saul becomes Paul and he becomes taught in the Lord and everything he ever come to know is now being converted to Jesus. And so that everything he preaches is preaching Jesus. We know that as hindsight, 2020, you know, the old saying hindsight is 2020. Well, we have hindsight and we have 2020 vision concerning the things that has already happened. And we're, we're scholars. But now I'm going to put a but in there and, and, and create an alternate universe. If Saul never converted, he would have done the exact same thing for Christ without being on the side of Christ. And so whether you're with Christ on this side of the fence or against Christ on that side of the fence, you are destined to do exactly what you're supposed to do. And one of those things that Paul was able to do was to, to create such a fear of him and a fear of the, of the Pharisees and a fear of those religious leaders that he, allowed, he made them scatter. He made these people who believed in Jesus scattered to different parts of the world. And so these people did not stop believing in Jesus because they were scattered. But they simply went to these different parts of the world as Christians believing in what they believed in. And so Paul, in, some, in, in, in a way, would have still dealt a big blow to, to the kingdom of Satan by doing what he did, even though he thought what he, what he was doing was right, even though it was wrong, it would have still worked out for Jesus. And this is what was so great about God. God always wins. Doesn't matter what part, what side of the fence you on. If you teetering on the, on the, on the edge of the fence, you better get to the left or the right so that you can make a clear decision. And whatever decision you make, you're going to be you're going to be in the place where God already knew you would be. God already knew you. He has chosen us before the foundation of the world. Now, let's go back to hindsight. Let's go back to the, on the scholarly us who already knows the story and how everything ended up for, um, for Saul. Now we see that Saul has become Paul and still 
his ministry affected a whole bunch of Gentiles. And so whether Saul was Paul or Paul was Saul, it didn't matter because the Gentiles was going to receive the word of God. And we see this in today's lesson with Philip. Now, look at, um, I want to go somewhere else too. It is something about, and, and this is also, this also uh, lends to the idea that, you know, Saul was also a student of Gamaliel. And I kind of mentioned Gamaliel in passing just last year, last week. And Gamaliel, he was a doctor of the law. He was a very renowned person and he was uh, one of the heads of the council. And so they really respected his words. And Gamaliel was the one who said, well, if this thing be of God, it will stand. And if you try to fight it and it's of God, you're fighting against God and you're going to lose. And so it was that mentality that thwarted, you know, early persecution. But now Paul, Saul is back at it. And it seems as though he's forgetting about whatever Gamaliel said, left Gamaliel's feet. And the reason I say feet, because in Acts chapter 22, read that real quick. We see uh, something, something written about Gamaliel and Paul. 22 verse 3, it says, I am verily a man which am a Jew born of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law and of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as you all are this day. And so we see that by Paul's admission that when he was Saul, he was taught of a man called Gamaliel. Yet in chapter eight, he was not really he was not really going by Gamaliel's way of thinking by by not doing what he was doing. He was sending people to jail. He was sending and he was consenting to the death of people because he was zealous of the law and he thought he was doing right. And so now we're going to take the sandwich middle and take it out of the out of it. And we're going to go to the other end of the sandwich, the other part of the bun, which is Philip. So we had Stephen. We had Paul. I mean, Saul. And now we have Philip. Today's lesson, we begin. Let me go to my book here. In Acts chapter eight, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise. And go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is a desert. And so now the spirit of the Lord, or it, well, I should say the angel of the Lord has now spoken to Philip to say, get out of this, this place you're in. And remember, Philip is now already by this time preaching to people in Samaria, which is the next step in the evolution of the Great Commission. Um, let's go back to that too. Uh, Matthew 28. No, no, no. Matthew, uh, it was Luke. Luke 24, I believe. Luke 24. It doesn't say it in 24. I think it's in, in I think I, I would probably see that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But let's look at, um, Let's look at uh, Luke 24, verse 47, what they, were, what they were actually doing. That repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name, talking about Christ, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so they already, they already graduated, you know, the, the, the witness to Jerusalem. They already graduated that idea. They already put the word so heavily in Jerusalem that it became a bomb to them. And so when things finally blew up, they, they scattered all the believers from Jerusalem, but the apostles remained. And this is uh, evident in, eight, in uh, Ro uh, Acts chapter 8, verse, uh, verse 1. And so we see, now we can go back to Acts chapter 1. I hope I'm not losing nobody. Acts chapter 1, and it says in verse 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. And so we see Philip, uh, after they've been scattered in chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, we see Philip now 
he is going into Samaria. So he has, the, the apostles and the uh, disciples has already come from Jerusalem and to parts of Judea. Now Philip is now entering into that Samaria zone. Now he leaves Samaria and goes down to meet with the eunuch in today's lesson, chapter 8, verse 26. And so again, it says, uh, you shall be witnesses Unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so we see the evolution of the gospel, the evolution of the word of God being preached. Whereas we had some problems last week, but it was in Jerusalem being resolved. We have problems in Jerusalem as far as persecution too, but it was resolved. Even the angel of the Lord broke them out of prison and said, go and speak to these people the words of this life. Keep doing what you're doing. And so they kept doing what they're doing. They won Jerusalem. And they even won, like I said earlier, they even won a company of priests and that were obedient to the faith. And now we have Philip in today's lesson being spoken to again by an angel of the Lord um, to tell him to go and arrive and toward the south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So now he's already coming out from Samaria. So he's already touched Jerusalem. He's already touched parts of Judea. And now he's already touched. He's coming out of Samaria from verse 25 and before. He's coming out of Samaria. And now he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure. And had come to Jerusalem for to worship. And so why were they in Jerusalem? Why was this Ethiopian eunuch coming from Jerusalem? Well, it, at this point in time, there were people that had come for a feast. And now it, I'm not really sure. And maybe, maybe you guys can help me out which feast it was that was occurring at this point in time. And so that was possibly the feast that, that all these people, one of the great feasts that they come from different lands to celebrate in Jerusalem, which is like the Mecca of, of Judaism, which is the epicenter of worship. And so the Ethiopian eunuch, although he's an Ethiopian, although he's a Gentile himself, he came to, to Jerusalem to worship. Worship who? He worshiped Yahweh. He worshiped in their temple. He worshiped. He was a proselyte of the Jew, Jew, Jewish uh, religion, Judaism. And he also had the scriptures with him. He was reading the scriptures. And so we see that he, he, had, he was a man of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Now, who is this Candace, queen of the Ethiopians? We can just leave it at that and say Candace is a queen of Ethiopia. But that's not really fair because they didn't have a proper name for a queen named Candace. Uh, in actuality, Candace was kind of like a title that was given to, you know, like a, like a Caesar. Or even um, in, in Egypt, they had pharaohs. But every king was called the pharaoh. And, w w and if you called a man a pharaoh, all you were saying that he was king of Egypt. And so when you're, when you're calling a woman Candace, all you're saying is that she's a, a woman of royalty in, the, in, in Ethiopia. Or a woman of royalty in Upper Nubia. And so we see that it's a dynastic title. You know, the dynasty of Ethiopian queens was that they were called Candace. And it's, a, it's like a title. It's kind of like a Kaiser, you know, a Caesar. Is, um, what's another one? Um, I can't think of a, another, another title. But yeah, it's just like, just like the, um, the Caesars of Rome. And so we have a title for a woman and this eunuch, he was under that royal woman of Ethiopia. And this, the, uh, in the Greek, the Gentiles called this place, the Greeks called this place Mero, which is found in Upper Nubia. Now, Upper Nubia is probably below Egypt and, you know, probably for a little further down. But um, I'm not too, you know, keen on the you know, the, the, the map of all these places. But all I know is that this place was in Africa and it was called Upper Nubia 
and this specifically was called Moreau. And this woman was not named Candace properly. She, that was her title. And so he was working under her. And he, although he worked under her, was given leave to go worship his God, Yahweh, in Jerusalem for whatever feast was going on. And so he had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Verse 28. Now he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Esaias. Then the spirit said unto Philip, now the angel of the Lord told Philip to go into this place. But once, the, once Philip was already in this place and he sees the Ethiopian eunuch reading and, you know, seeing the eunuch afar off, the spirit said, the spirit, capital S, P-I-R-T, is the spirit of God. The spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Now, isn't that something when the spirit speaks to Philip, he runs to do what God told him to do. I wish I can just do that all the time. I wish that we all as the church can do that all the time. Hear the spirit of the Lord speaking to us and we just run to do it. Wouldn't it be an awesome thing if we were just obedient to the spirit of the Lord running to do the things that God has called us to do? Now, that was just an aside. I'll give you that for free. But it says, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias and said, understandest thou what thou readest? And so what a great question, uh, because at this point now, Philip, although he's he's not said to be some great, you know, historian or great, you know, Pharisee, you know, a, a great teacher or anything. All we know about Philip is that he was a man of great wisdom, full of the Holy Ghost, and was an honest report. Remember from last week's lesson, it was he was one of the seven that was chosen for the business, and you know, the, uh, to, for the ministration of even the widows, and to do the things that the apostles could not be tied down doing, and, uh, unless you know, unless they all. Um, started to lose their way and started to, you know, stop reading the word and stop preaching the word and teaching the word. So Philip was one of those people, but Philip was also used by God to preach the word and to teach the word. And so he was being um, sent by an angel and spoken to by the spirit himself to go and witness to this Ethiopian eunuch. And so he asked him the question, well, do you understand what you read? And verse 31, he said, how can I just understand the ramifications of this? Some people can't be asked that question because then they'll be too proud on the inside of themselves and to, to not know something. He was he went to uh, to Israel, to Jerusalem to worship and he had his own scripture and he was reading and some stranger on the street actually comes and asks him, well, do you know what you're reading? But this man did not take the proud route. He went humble. And he said, well, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And so it is a great humility that this, this Ethiopian eunuch, a man of great authority under a royal woman, who, who lived in Ethiopia or upper Nubia, this man could have said, look, I don't need your help. I can get people to get me understanding. And I, I already know. And he could have just lied and said, I know I don't need you. But he didn't know. And he wasn't proud to the point where he was going to not, not all uh, at least ask this man, well, what do you think? And so he says, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. Now look at Romans chapter 10. This kind of beautifully comes together with that. Romans chapter 10. Verses 11 through 16. It says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? This is what he was asking. Well, how can I except some man should guide me? 
And so Paul takes it from there and goes down a route of thinking, which is very, very good. And so he says, how, uh, how shall, no, how then shall they call on him when they, have not, I forgot where I left off. How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Now, in this case, Philip was sent by an angel of the Lord to go into this place and then was sent by the spirit of the Lord to go and meet with this man specifically. And so how shall he preach except he be sent is what, what Paul is now saying in chapter 10, verse 15. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And look at verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? And we're going to come back to that idea again uh, later on. Because Paul even quotes the same scripture that Isaiah is now reading. Uh, Isaiah, that eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch is preaching in Isaiah. And so he says, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened not he, not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And he stops right there. And so where do we read that? If we go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 verse 7 and the clause B. And now I'm going to break it up because remember, in original scripture, there are no numbers. There are no chapter numbers and verse numbers. And so in order for me to extract what he's reading from verse 32 to 33, I'm going to take exactly where I find it in, the, in our numbering system. And so we see Isaiah 53, 7b to 8c. And it reads as this. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Stop. And so we see that it's nothing, nothing in chapter 8 verse 32 to 33 reads before or after that part. It's a single part extracted from Isaiah. And so now he says, and the eunuch answered Philip. And said, I pray thee, of whom speakest thou the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? And so now this opens up a can of worms, a great day for Philip. Because probably, you know, if, he, if Philip was anything like me and somebody asked me about who this man was in Isaiah 53. Or what something meant. And I knew the answer because the spirit of God was, was sending me to this person and I'm already revved up because I just came from a revival in Samaria. And I'm already revved up because the angel of the Lord spoke to me, number one. And then the spirit of the Lord also spoke to me specifically. Go join. I got more than double confirmation that the word that is in me is about to be taught to this man. And I'm going to be an effective witness for this particular man. I'm already excited about this whole situation. Uh, Philip is probably just as excited as I would be or as you would be. And so it's, it's, some, it's, it's a great story because a lot of things can be taken from this as nuggets. Verse 35 says, and this is our key verse. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Isn't it something to, to one, one t at one point in your life, you knew nothing about Jesus. And you probably didn't know nothing about the Bible. Or you knew something about the Bible, but you didn't know Jesus. So therefore, Jesus was not applied to your understanding in the Bible. And so now you come to know Jesus and you read different parts of the Bible. You can read Genesis and see Jesus there. You can read Exodus and you'll see Jesus there. You can read you know, uh, Leviticus and you see Jesus there. It's because the, the scriptures have been open to the church. This is why it's so easy for Philip, who is already being led by the spirit, who is already being taken, you know, and, and directed by angels of the Lord, who has already, you know, done some great and marvelous things in the eyesight of man. 
He already performed miracles. He's already being moved on in, in, in spite of what has happened to his buddy, his partner, Stephen. He is now going on to preach the word to this man. And what he says is so amazing. He preached unto him, Jesus, beginning in Isaiah. So when you go to Isaiah, can you preach Jesus? Or when you go to Amos, or when you go to Jonah, or when you go to any of the prophets, can you see Jesus? When you go to the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Songs of Solomon, can you preach Jesus? And so this is something that it, it kind of deteriorates all kinds of misunderstandings or any kind of barriers that we do have. And remember, the lesson is called call to break down barriers. And so what barrier is here? The barrier is that this is an Ethiopian eunuch coming from south somewhere. He is not Jewish, but he's definitely not a uh, Christian. He's a proselyte, but he's definitely not Christian. He uh, has the word, but he does not have the spirit. And so it's very, very uh, telling because even in, in, the, in the verses before today's lesson, when Philip goes to preach to Samaritans in Samaria, he preaches to them a word. And I want, I want to actually show you that. Look at uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 12. It says, after he starts to um, teach them, he says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Baptized, some are physical baptism, that they were baptized in the water. They believed and they were baptized. But when you look up ahead in verse 14, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Why? Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And so we see the difference between them receiving the baptism of water in Jesus' name than receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so, one, number one, you can't have the Word of God without the Spirit of God. And this is a very important distinction in the book of Acts. These people, these apostles, they had the Word of God coming into Jerusalem waiting for the promise, but they had not yet received the Spirit. But once they received the spirit, they were able to become witnesses. Now, I know I'm stepping on last week's uh, lesson again, but coming into today's lesson, we now uh, are breaking down barriers. We're not just preaching to the Jews or to Judaism or to, uh, to the Judeans. We're now preaching to Sumerians and to the uttermost parts of the world. And that's beginning with the eunuch. This is why it is written. This is why Luke uh, made it very clear the the avenue the, the avenue in which the 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 message of the kingdom of God the the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be preached beginning at Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world and so in that in that linear progression we see that the the the, the gospel is being preached and it does not matter whether it's to the Jews or the Gentiles, the gospel is the same and is the same unifying force behind, you know, any schism that has happened in the church will be broken down. And any persecution that happens outside of the church will not phase it because we are unified. And whether my brother in China is being, you know, is being uh, forced into the caves, into the holes, into the underground, and while my brothers in and maybe in Muslim territory, they're being forced to not speak outwardly about Jesus. Otherwise, their life is in danger. You know, I'm still here. I might not be there, but I'm still here feeling their pain. I'm still praying for them. I'm still part of the body and we're still together, but we're still uh, many members in one body, but we're all together. And it does not matter whether you're black or whether you're black or you're white, whether you're Spanish speaking or English speaking, it does not matter. God has called us to be unified 
and not only be unified, but be able to, with that unity, break down any inner struggle and withstand any outward struggle, whether it be inside with schisms or outside with persecutions, we are to be unified together and break down those barriers. And so what makes us so powerful that we can actually perform this very thing, this very feat? Well, it's because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke to Philip. The Holy Spirit is inside of the apostles. The Holy Spirit has not only come into the Jew Jewish believers, but now has crept into Sumerian believers. Now, the Jew now that, that gospel that was preached to Jerusalem first and then to, to Judea, Judea and also to Samaria in the early parts of chapter 8, now is coming to the uttermost parts of the world where he, where he begins with this Ethiopian eunuch. Because now the Ethiopian eunuch, we're going to see that he doesn't go back to Jerusalem or go back to some other place in the confines of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, or, or whatever. He goes back to where he comes from in Upper Nubia, which is where the Ethiopian eunuch is from, Ethiopia. And so... Let's see, verse 36. And they went their way, and they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? This is another great scripture, another great nugget, because guess what? There are some people that think that baptism is not necessary. Baptism, I'm going to say, and I'm talking about water baptism, not the, not the spirit baptism. Water baptism is indeed necessary it saves the soul according to scripture and how does it save the soul it's called obedience to the gospel and if you and, and this is one of those things where it actually gives us a doctrine we actually can formulate a doctrine from what has happened with this Ethiopian unit we know already that Peter has already given to these people in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 he says repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We see that when, when, when the gospel is being preached, what needs to be done now is obedience to the gospel. Now, where do I get that idea of, of obedience to the gospel? Well, let's look at, um, let's look at Isaiah 53.1. And remember, I told you we was going to come back to that because uh, Romans chapter 10 actually ended that when, when I read Romans chapter 10, 11 through 16, it actually ended with Isaiah 53, 1 being, being um, quoted. Isaiah 53, 1 says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And so, who believes our report? Uh, this, is, this is something that Paul is now trying to teach them in Romans chapter 10, verse 16, I'm talking about the Romans, a Roman church. It says, but they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, what he say? Lord, who hath believed our report? And so believing the report, believing the gospel is actually obeying the gospel. Now, is that all you got, Lewis? Where, where, where else can you get this idea of obeying the gospel? Why must we obey anything? Because there's, um, there's doctrine out there. There's people that, that actually teaches that you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. Jesus already dealt with it. He already uh, paid the price. And this is true. Jesus paid the price of salvation for us. But he has not, he has not made us believe anything. He has not forced us to take his doctrine and say, okay, I believe it now. I believe it. No. He has simply given us the ability to find another, another uh, alternative solution or alternative decision other than, you know, remain in sin and die. What he has given us is the ability to make a decision and turn away from sin and turn to Christ. And so by turning to Christ, we believe in the gospel. We obey the gospel. So... Where I get this from? Look at 2 Thessalonians 1 and 8. It's just a few scriptures. 2 Thessalonians verses 1 
Wait a minute. Is it one and eight? Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse eight. Um, it says, "In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ." And so, the idea of obedience to the gospel is in Scripture. Now, if you want to read the entire context, please do. That's First and Second Thessalonians chapter one. Read the entire context of what's being written there. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is the same gospel we preach. There, are, there is no different gospel. There's only one gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried in the grave, and rose on the third day with all power in his hand. And he gave power and strength to those men who would believe on him to become effective witnesses. How? By the power of the Holy Ghost. That is the gospel. And all the things in between that the, the apostles were taught, they, they actually taught those things. Everything that Jesus had taught them, everything that they could remember, every kind of um, any little minutia, any little uh, crooks and crevice of, of doctrine that they were able to gather from what Jesus had spoken while, they, while he was yet alive and what he had spoken in the spirit. Because now remember, he has gone away and has come back to them in spirit form, the Holy Spirit. And you can read that. In you can read that in chapter, John chapter 14 and chapter 15. And look at also 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Again, the idea of obedience to, to the gospel is very important. And so we can't just say, oh, I believe in Jesus and then don't don't obey his words. Um, and I should probably also uh, go back to another idea here. And whatsoever I commend you. Uh, Matthew, I think that's Matthew 28 at this point. Matthew 28, verse 18. It says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Look what verse 20 says. It says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so everything that Jesus had ever taught them, every little, when he broke the bread, that was an indication to them, like, look, this is Jesus. When he appeared to them after his passion, after he died and was rose from, risen again from the grave, he appeared to the disciples. And it wasn't until he broke the bread and prayed over it that they understood and knew that that was Jesus. And so it was Jesus's behavior that they were mimicking at all times, even down to the very act of baptism. Look at uh, where is baptism? Let's look at back, the baptism, Matthew 3 and 16. And this is something that the, the Ethiopian eunuch wanted for himself to be baptized according to what Philip was preaching. Because remember, Philip preached to the Samaritans. And they believed this word, they believed the words of Jesus, and that they were baptized, but they were baptized in water, not with the Holy Ghost. This is why the apostles sent Peter and John to Samaria, so they could lay hands on the Samarians, and they received the Holy Ghost as well. And so we see Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, finally, it says, And Jesus, went when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. I want to focus on the, on the way the scripture reads. And he went, went up straightway out of the water. Is the exact same thing that both the eunuch and Philip did. Uh, maybe I, I went too fast. Okay, what the... Verse 36, I, I kind of jumped the gun. I went to 39, but let's look at 36 again. And so the eunuch asked uh, Philip, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And so he, in essence, is being obedient to the gospel, obedient to what Philip is preaching, 
Philip is, uh, is preaching that he must be baptized just like everybody else was baptized. And so the eunuch wants to be baptized and he comes across this water in his, in his chariot. And all of a sudden he said, well, there's water right there. What does hinder me to be, no, excuse me. What does hinder me to be baptized just like everybody else? I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized just like this Jesus. Remember, Jesus was baptized not because he needed to be baptized, but look at what, what it said in verse 15, the verse before that. Uh, John forbade him, verse 14, and he said, I need, I, have need of, I need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And so John was actually compelled by Jesus to baptize Jesus, not because Jesus needed it, but so that Jesus can show in his body what needs to happen to the rest of his followers that will come after him. Remember, he is the forerunner. He is the one who walks in front of us and we walk right behind him. Every step he takes, we take. This is how the apostles were doing this thing. This is how the apostles even referred to their belief system. They called Christianity early on the way. And so Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. Everything that Jesus had ever said and done, they were trying to mimic it down to this very behavior. When they broke bread, they prayed. When they, when they came to the different hours of the day, they prayed. They prayed for everything. And they did everything as Jesus did. When they came across lunatics and people with palsies and sicknesses, they did what Jesus did and prayed to the Father in heaven and that in the name of Jesus that they would be healed. They even had their dead raised from the, de from the, the, the dead again. And so we see that with Paul and with Peter and, and, and the sickness that was in the land that they, they put them in the streets. And then we could read that, in, I think it was in Acts chapter 5 where, where the apostles had people come out in the streets and when Peter crossed by them, just the, the shadow of Peter. And it also mentioned that Paul's shadow um, touched, that the things that touched Paul, like the cloths, they put it on sick people that were not even in his presence. And by essence of the, of the touch and the belief in, in, in Jesus Christ, they were healed. These all things that can be attributed to something that happened to Jesus in one point or, an, or another. When the woman with the issue of blood touched his hem, the hem of his garment. Where do you think the idea of these handkerchiefs and these things that were placed on the body of Paul, when they touched them, they were healed. This is exactly what happened with Jesus. They were mimicking Jesus in the early church. He was the way. And so when Philip baptized this man, he says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest, mayest be baptized. And so this is something that is prerequisite for baptism. You must believe that he is the Christ. You must believe the gospel. And if you believe him and believe the gospel, then you should baptize. This is something that was commanded by even Peter. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. And Peter was only fulfilling the, command, the commission where, where Jesus told him, go and teach them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And Peter broke that down and said, look, the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost is Jesus. That's the name of Christ. Luke chapter 24 tells us in the name of Christ. And so we, we, we gather doctrines by, by, by regarding Jesus and everything he said and everything he has done. If Jesus didn't say it and Jesus didn't do it, we shouldn't say it and we shouldn't do it. It's the same thing that I said a couple of weeks ago about the prophets. That if the prophets didn't receive a word from the Lord, they should not have said anything. They should not be saying, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord thus said not. And so this is the same idea, uh, even bringing the idea in the book of Hebrews, how God, who had son, at, at different times in diverse manners spoken to the fathers in times past, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And so now we don't listen to the prophets like they used to listen to the prophets. We listen to the son like they listen to the prophets. 
And every word that came from the prophet's mouth was to be was to be taken heed to. Um, and so let me just move on from there. Verse 38 says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still. Oh, I'm sorry. In ver the middle of verse 37, he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And this is the same admission, the same thing that Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so when Jesus said to Peter, Simon, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. This is the same idea that has now entered into the eunuch. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to him. That admission doesn't come out of a person simply because the uh, spirit wanted to fake it. No, no spirit in hell is going to admit that and want to admit that. And so when this man said this, I believe that Jesus Christ, the son of God, he was able to go further in his belief and be obedient to everything else. He was ready to be obedient to the gospel. He was ready to live a life yielded to the Holy Ghost, a life yielded to God's word, Jesus Christ. And so he went down into the water. He commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both, went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, now remember the, the language here, come up out of the water, is the exact same language that Matthew 3.16 says. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. So what does this tell us about water baptism? Can we be sprinkled or dipped? Is that a proper baptism? It's either you do it the way the Bible says to do it, or you don't do it because you don't have the opportunity to do it. But if you have the opportunity to do it, you should do it. Now, this is barring any kind of, uh, any kind of struggles a, a human being has. If they're not nowhere near any water, and this person dies, and even though he believes in Jesus Christ, the Son of the, Son of the living God, and dies before he can be baptized... That man is not going to hell because he could not be baptized in water. Simply, the Ethiopian eunuch gives us a perfect example of having the ability to and being obedient to the water baptism. Being obedient to the point where here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? I want to be obedient. I want to be baptized just like the rest of those people were baptized that you were talking about. Just like Jesus was baptized in, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. I want to be baptized. And here's water. There's nothing that hinders me from doing it. And now, if there's water and you, and you deny and don't want to get baptized, there's a problem with that. You should want to, to be able to, you know... Um, Put yourself in the number. You should be able to uh, to do it without any kind of problems. You should have no issues with being obedient to that doctrine. Be baptized. If the water's there, be baptized. Don't don't hold up. Don't 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 deny the chance of you being able to be baptized. Don't deny yourself of that that beautiful experience. It means something. It actually is symbolizing something. And it's not just for you, it's for the community around you, it's for the people around you to see that another soul has gone down in Jesus' name. What is this whole thing about baptism? This gendereth questions about what, what, do I, what is this baptism all about? And this is the same idea that, that when, when Philip found the eunuch reading out of Isaiah, Isaiah that it gendered questions. The eunuch had questions and Philip was there. The spirit put him there to answer those questions. We're called to break down barriers. And one of those barriers is having questions unanswered, having questions in our head because we have roadblocks, uh, because we're a certain kind of people, because we're a certain color of people, because we don't speak this language. I want somebody to break this down to me in my language. Send me a preacher that speaks in Spanish to speak the word of God. Send me a preacher that I can relate to. That's not like these people I'm afraid of at the moment, but I need someone that I can relate to. Send me that person. And Philip was that guy. 
Philip was told by the angel of the Lord, which was told by God to tell Philip, go into this place. And now the spirit of the Lord, seeing him, went and, uh, went and told him, go arise and go meet with that man. There's some questions he has to be answered. And so when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch, when they both came up out of the water, he did not see Philip again. He disappeared. Now, you can explain this away all you want. But all I know is that that same word caught away is the same word harpazo in Greek, which means catch away, which is the same word that the Apostle Paul tells us that God is that Jesus, when he comes back, he's going to catch away his church. That's harpazo. That's the exact same word. The same spirit was able to take the, um, uh, Philip out of one place and put him in another is the same spirit that's going to take us out of this place right next to him in glory. It's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that's going to quicken our mortal bodies. This is what happened to Philip. And although Philip did not go to heaven at this point, he was transported, translated from one place to another. As a matter of fact, I think it was Azotus, actually, because I'm not there, and the, the lesson doesn't go to verse 40. But uh, Philip was taken to, and if I can get there quick enough, chapter 8, verse 40, it says, But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And remember I said that Philip was the one who went to Samaria, and Samaria received the word, and they sent the apostles to lay hands on them that they may receive the Holy Ghost. Philip is also the man that was called out of Samaria to go even further into the uttermost parts of the world. Philip was the one. After Stephen was stoned and Saul was introduced and Saul was the one who was kind of pivotal in the moment that he that his people killed Stephen. We see now that that the the gospel is being thrusted into the outer parts of all of Judea, out of out of Samaria, into the uttermost parts of the earth. And then we're going to finally see that Paul, Saul, who is going to be met by the Lord, is going to be converted and take that same message that, that Stephen had and that Philip had and continue and spread it out even further to the Asia Minor, to, to, to Rome even. He's going to take these, this word to even King Agrippa and to people of high stature. This is what's going, to, what's going to happen. And so Philip was the one that kind of broke the first barrier into Samaria and into Caesarea, into the uttermost parts of the earth. This is in direct correlation to being an effective witness as a result of the Holy Ghost being in them. And also the commission, meaning the word of God. And so there's one thing I want you to know, that the word of God without the spirit is pointless. And the spirit without the word of God is pointless. If you have one without the other, you are just stagnant. You're not doing nothing. And if you have the spirit trying to do, uh, if you have the word of God without the spirit, trying to do things that you're not called to do, you're in trouble. Don't do it. If you have the, the word of uh, the spirit of God without the word of God, you're going to go into places not knowing where you need to go and not being led properly. This is why it's important to have both the word of God and the spirit of God and mushing it together on the inside of our hearts. And this is what we need in order to be effective witnesses and to break down barriers. I hope that this lesson was a great blessing to all of you and i um, I look forward to hearing from you in the comments. If you like this video, subscribe, share, and share on Facebook, share it on whatever media you have extra from YouTube. Just share and, and like. Do whatever, you know, the thumbs up, the hearts, you know, the heart plus. I don't even know what, what YouTube has got, got going on. But I want you to share this, and I want the gospel of Jesus Christ to be spread. I want them to know that there is a man out there 
in the middle of New Jersey teaching the Sunday school lessons and that they don't need to be hindered in listening to the Sunday school lesson before they get to church and the Sunday school lesson is taught that they may, and they may have the answers to the teacher's questions already. God bless you all.